us to Ephesians chapter 4. And while you're going there, just remind you about the afternoon service. We have at 4.30, the sign at the front is still the old sign. We are going to be still in the process of getting the, uh, the new one organised. The afternoon service is not at 5 as it says on the sign, but at 4.30, uh, at 4.30, <coughs> which is actually a result of, of COVID, really. Um, we moved it forward, but it uh, works well. So afternoon service at 4.30. It's seen come along, seen plenty of favourite hymns. It's a blessing. And we have a separate message from the Word of God, of course. So Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, we're going to look at verse 1 through to verse 7. Ephesians 4, verse 1 to verse 7. And uh, Ephesians 4, verse 1 reads, I therefore, uh, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. And verse 7, But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you that we can uh, indeed come here this morning. We will come aside from the world, uh, Lord, to open your word, to delve into its riches, Lord, to learn more of you. And uh, Father, I, I just do pray as we do so that you would help us to, Lord, uh, just. Uh, have an open heart to your word. May the Holy Spirit of God lead and guide in your word. Lord, may you be more glorified in our lives through your word. And Father, I just uh, thank you for these things. Lord, I do commit them to you and do ask and pray them in the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> okay, so we looked last Sunday uh, afternoon at Paul stating he was the prisoner of Jesus Christ for, our, for us Gentiles. And you can see that in, uh, first of all, in, in Gen uh, sorry, Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. And, uh, and so for what reason, and if you read the verses there following in Ephesians chapter 3, it was to preach, of course, the gospel of the grace of God, which was a mystery uh, in ages past. And uh, being a prisoner there, where Paul says, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, uh, simply means having his liberty restrained uh, in the sense of uh, Paul's great burden uh, through his life was to go to his own people, the children of Israel. <clears throat> and you can see that in the Word of God in numerous places, how uh, you know, his calling at the beginning was to go to the Gentiles, to kings, uh, and and then also to the children of Israel. That was sort of the last thing, because he was called to be the apostle of the Gentiles. And, uh, and then you, you think about different places in the, in the Word of God where he uh, could wish himself accursed from Christ for the children of Israel's sake. Not that that's possible if you're truly saved, if you've truly trusted Christ as your Saviour, and he, he knows that, but he was expressing how much of a burden he had for them. And so... Uh, it doesn't mean that Paul was half-hearted in his ministry towards the Gentiles. Not at all. Not at all. Uh, you think about the uh, ministry in Ephesus when he was there. He was in Ephesus for a bit over three years. And uh, it ended up being the centre uh, for the gospel to go out into all Asia. As you can see in Acts chapter 19, verse 10, and if you're following on your verses. Uh, and, then, and then when Paul was on his way to Jerusalem for that ill-fated trip to Jerusalem to try and convince his fellow Jews about the Lord Jesus Christ. On his way there, he called for the elders uh, of the, uh, the church in Ephesus and, uh, and he warned them, he said, he reminded them, sorry, of how he had warned them day and night with tears uh, about uh, you know, wolves coming in to tear the flock apart and so forth. 
So his ministry was so, so sincere. In fact, I was saying to somebody yesterday uh, that when you think about uh, the ministry in Ephesus, that was probably the pinnacle of Paul's ministry because it, the Word of God went out into all Asia there. And churches were started and, uh, in, you know, at the same time. And so uh, Paul was not half-hearted in his ministry to the Gentiles, but his great burden was his fellow, fellow Jews, fellow children of Israel. And so there was a balance in Paul's life. God had restrained him. He made him his prisoner. Uh, to go to the Gentiles with the gospel, which he did wholeheartedly, uh, but he, he, at the same time, while he would have loved to have liberty to just be going to the to the children of Israel, he still uh, took a bit of liberty and went first wherever he went to the Jews. If you if you read through the Book of Acts, you'll see that he would always go and seek out the Jews first. And so uh, that's what it means by being a prisoner for our sake. Uh, he did the ministry that God gave him to do, to go to the Gentiles, to you and I, anyone that's not a child, a, 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 an Israelite, a Jew. But uh, at the same time, he had that balance there. He, he uh, took that liberty where he could. Now, looking at our text verses here this morning, we see in chapter 4, verse 1, Paul used that same phrase. He said, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord. I therefore the prisoner of the Lord. Now, when he says, therefore, he's making a conclusion from what was in the previous chapter. And, uh, and so, uh, the conclusion is, is this. If you look there in, in, your, uh, in, in chapter 4, verse 1, it says that you would walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. To walk worthy of that vocation. So meaning, vocation meaning that our walk would crop with Christ would reflect what our calling uh, is according to the will of God for us. Our vocation. That people would see God's distinguishing grace upon our lives. Or in other words, that people would see how God has bestowed his favour upon us. And uh, in looking at those verses, chapter 4 verses 1 to 1 to 3 in particular at the moment, we see the distinguishing marks that need to, that need to be upon our lives. Uh, verse uh, number two, we see there it, it says, lowliness and meekness with long suffering. Uh, then it says in verse two also, forbearing one another in love. And then verse three, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Now we're not going to go back over what we looked at uh, last week, but at the same time, uh, I just do want to mention there, if you, you think about, about what's written in those two verses there in particular, uh, you can see uh, the order of the fruit of the Spirit backwards in the sense of, uh, you know, we know the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, uh, faith, meekness, temperance. And, uh, and you know, uh, Paul is saying to, to us Gentiles, Paul, our prisoner for our sakes, he's saying, you know, uh, we ought to have lowliness and meekness first of all. That's what God needs to see in our lives uh, with long-suffering, which is what uh, others need to see in our lives. Not God, but others. And then forbearing one another in love and then endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Uh, that's the fruit of the Spirit that we experience within so you've got the three categories of the fruit of the Spirit there, starting with what God sees, meekness, or should see. And, uh, and ending where it begins, endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And now that's a, that's a very important phrase there which we're going to look at. Uh, and so why is that? So well, let, let's continue to, to read the verses that we've looked at this morning in chapter 4 and, and see. So look at verses 4 to 6. It says, There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Now obviously where it says and in you all, that's talking about those that are truly born again, uh, those that have truly accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Saviour. They've seen uh, their need to be saved from their own sins uh, and 
in other words, guilty before God and, and, and they can see God's great love for them that, that they've accepted him. So that's written to all born again believers. Now, looking, let's break those verses down a little bit, just a little bit. Uh, first of all, it says there, verse 4, there is one body and one spirit, uh, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. So, one body. What's that? That's the, that's the body of all the believers uh, that have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, for that one body, there's one spirit. There's not multiple Holy Spirits, there's only one. And uh, then chapter, uh, sorry, verse 5, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, it's, that's talking of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then verse 6, one God and Father of all, uh, who is above all and through all and in you all. Of course, it, as it states there, it's talking about God the Father. And so in those three verses, we're seeing uh, Father, Son and Holy Ghost uh, in, in, in those verses. And, uh, and what Paul, under the inspiration of God, is, uh, is pointing out there, that we have a unified God. He is Father, Son and Holy Ghost, and these three are one. They are one. There's unity in, in the body, in the, in, sorry, in, encapsulated in, in the Trinity, because they are one. But you know, uh, the point of Paul here is that you and I, as the body of born again believers, uh, we are encapsulated into that one God. And, uh, and it's showing, his, what, what that's showing is how important that is for us in our walk day by day to be, as it says there uh, in verse a number, sorry, I've lost it, there we go. Uh, sorry, verse number three, endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So it's important for us in our day by day lives as Christians to be uh, keeping unity in the Spirit in the Holy, through the Holy Spirit of God in our lives. And that, that's why Paul has, has broken it down there. That's why God inspired him to, to say to, to us, stop and think about it. There's only one Spirit. There's one body of believers. There's one Spirit. Uh, there's one Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, uh, who is above all and through all and in you all, so the, so the Father there is, uh, sorry, the Lord there is, is saying through Paul, it's just one God. And, and you and I forever will be unified with that one God in heaven. And so here on this earth, uh, the Lord is getting Paul to write there again in verse chapter, chapter 4, verse 1. I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you. And there's that word beseech again. Where, where he's, he's begging us. He's saying, look, you know, the Lord has restrained me to be the minister to the Gentiles, and that's fine and that's good. I'm, I'm happy for that, and, and I'm blessed by the ministry God's given me to, to perform, but I'm beseeching you, have a stop and think about God himself. He is God the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and they are one. They are unified. And... Born again believer, uh, you are part of uh, God's family. You are in Christ. And we'll look at these verses in a minute. And so we also, uh, as a body of believers, need to, be, need to be unified. Let's think of Galatians 2.20. What does it say there? It says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So Christ is in every born again believer. 1 Corinthians 6.19 What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, which ye have of God the Father, and ye are not your own. And yet here in Ephesians 4 verse 6, it tells us that the Father is in us all. And so uh, it's talking about there in Ephesians 4 verse 6 talking about the, about the Father being in, in every born again believer. So uh, like I've said there is one body there is one God 
And in the spiritual sense, we are all, we are one in unity in the Lord. And we will be forever if we're truly born again. But Paul here, as the prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ in Ephesians 4, is admonishing us to be in unity in this physical life as one, to be as one while we born again believers live out physical lives on this earth day by day, uh, as he said there in verse 3, endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So endeavouring means earnest in pursuit. Are we earnest in pursuit of unity one with another uh, in Christ? So just as we're one in the body of Christ overall, uh, which we saw includes not just the Lord Jesus, but the Holy Spirit and the Father, uh, for all of eternity, we need to listen to the exhortation of Paul, uh, the apostle who was restrained to minister to us Gentiles, to strive for that unity through the Spirit in this sin-sick world. And it is a sin-sick world. And it's getting worse at all, at all, time, all the time, isn't it? Our first point this morning is this. Uh, if we are born again, we have one purpose. In unity in our lives through the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll, I'll say that again. If we are born again, we have one purpose in unity in our lives through the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul, in the midst of explaining he was the prisoner of the Lord Jesus for us Gentiles, reveals that the Father has an eternal purpose, uh, which he purposed through our Lord Jesus Christ, as it says in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 11. If you have a look there, uh, that's our theme for the year, the eternal purpose of God. And if you look in Ephesians 3 verse 11, in the midst of this, this passage where Paul is calling himself the prisoner of Jesus Christ uh, for us Gentiles, uh, in chapter 3 verse 11 it says, According to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Uh, the Lord has his eternal purpose. And while specifically that's talking about what precedes verse 11, that is in essence the gospel, uh, for this dispensation of grace, which had been not seen in ages prior to that time, Paul's ex ex sorry, exhortation of unity in the Spirit is for us very much essential to God's eternal purpose. What we look at in chapter 4, verses 1 to 7, is very much a part of uh, being able to be used by God for His eternal purpose in, in this life. I want to stop and think of, for, for, of a few examples here for a minute to try and bring out just how important this is for us in our lives. Let's start back at the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and he made man and woman. He made Adam and Eve and they're in the garden there and, and uh, the serpent comes along and he, he tempts uh, Eve and uh, she eats of the tree. Uh, Adam follows suit, they fall, sin enters into the world. And, uh, and at that particular time, as the Lord's giving his judgment on matters in Genesis 3.15, the Lord gives a prophecy of what the Lord Jesus Christ would do in the future. And that is, he's talking of the cross in Genesis 3.15. Going forward to around 2100 BC, the time of Abraham, uh, the Lord tested Abraham by, get, uh, by having him to go to the land of Moriah. And the Lord led him to the Mount of the Lord, uh, Genesis chapter 22, verses 2 and 14. You can see that uh, the land of Moriah, and the Mount of, uh, sorry, the Mount of the Lord there, which is Mount Moriah where Solomon's temple would later be built. Very, very, it's, yeah, it's, it's wonderful to study that. So God was providing a wonderful picture of what we now clearly understand was the Lord Jesus Christ going to the cross for our sins to make full payment. For the Lord tested Abraham by saying, take uh, Isaac, thine only son, and, and, uh, and sacrifice him. Uh, there on, on the mountain which I shall show thee, and, and a place that I'll show you. And, and so Abraham faithfully went and did what God commanded. But we know that God intervened and, and stopped Abraham from sacrificing Isaac. A wonderful picture of what the Lord would later do on the cross in that particular place, in that same place, in, on Mount Moriah. And so the Lord was showing his eternal purpose through the ages, 
down through when you when you look through the scriptures, you can see God was giving hints of His eternal purpose all through the Old Testament. Uh, we can jump over other places where the Lord was revealing His eternal purpose and go to Isaiah, and uh, it, which is called the fifth gospel. We know in, in the New Testament we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but Isaiah in the Old Testament, about 700 BC, uh, was the what, what, what we, is what we call the fifth gospel. Why is that? Well, it's due to there being much prophecy there of what the Lord Jesus Christ was, was going to do, future tense at that time. Uh, Isaiah 53, of course, being the, the, uh, probably the most well-known chapter in, in Isaiah, uh, describing the Lord as the Lamb of God. And, uh, and so, all through, we can see the Lord building up through the Old Testament. Uh, the Old Testament law pointed to Christ all the way through it. And so uh, we can see the Lord building up through the Old Testament, uh, revealing to revealing His great love and grace towards all mankind. That is His eternal purpose. Now you stop and you think about it for a minute. Just stop and think. The Lord put that much work and effort into what we can see in the Word of God all through the Old Testament, starting from, from Adam and Eve, talking of His eternal purpose, uh, when there in Genesis 3.15, uh, as we looked at with Abraham taking Isaac to Mount Moriah, as God told him to, to, to sacrifice him, and we know that you know, the Lord didn't let him do that, but it was a picture of Christ. Isaiah, uh, David, is a type of Christ. So many different things. In the Old Testament, we see God saying, this is my eternal purpose. It is so very important. It is vital in the whole plan of things. And it is. And so here is Paul, the minister to the Gentiles. He's been restrained from going to the people that he would really love to go to first and foremost, his own people, the Jews. He's been restrained to go to us Gentiles and he's, and he's saying in chapter 3, you know, uh, the, the, the whole thing of the, the grace of God, the gospel of the grace of God uh, in the Old Testament, it, it was there but it was hidden. It literally says it was hidden in ages past. But now God here in chapter 4, uh, sorry, in chapter, but now in chapter 3 he's saying, but now God has revealed it through the Lord Jesus Christ. We understand all those things in the Old Testament now. And it's, and it's vital. It is, it is what the Lord has been working towards through all of history. To pay the price. It is His eternal purpose as we can see there. Go back to chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 1 if you're there in Ephesians. Have a look at Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 10. It says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. And so, you know, we're seeing there another explanation for God's eternal purpose. He's working towards that time where he's going to gather together all of those that have trusted him because of the cross, because the payment has been made. That's his eternal purpose. And God yearns for, for us to be part of that, to, to, to share the gospel with other people, to let people know that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, should not go to hell, in other words, but have everlasting life. He, he wants us to share that. He wants us to be part of that. And so Paul here in chapter 4 <clears throat> excuse me, is explaining, Paul here in chapter 4 is explaining something that is vital for you and I as born again believers, as part of the, the overall body of Christ, uh, to be part of something, something we need to, to, to get, that we really need to grasp for our walk with Christ in, in being part of the eternal purpose of God. Have a look there. In, uh, in chapter 4, verse 4, uh, sorry, verse 3, endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. 
This is the hinge point for you and I. This is the thing that is so vital for you and I in our lives that God can use us to be part of His eternal purpose to the fullest extent that He wants to. We need to grasp it, that we are to earnestly pursue it. Earnestly. We're to really endeavour to do what the Lord has set down here. Now, so in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 7, where Paul is saying about being a prisoner of the Lord and explaining these things, it's not, separate, it's not a separate matter to what we read in chapter 3. They go hand in hand. It's an essential part that the hearts of the people uh, could be reached. Let's have a look in Acts chapter 2. Go to Acts chapter 2. Keep your place in Ephesians uh, chapter 4. But go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. And we see the ultimate example of unity of the Spirit as, as we're admonished to to pursue in, in Ephesians 4. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, have a look there, it says uh, that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Now this is the approximate 3,000 people that we see in verse 41 that were saved on the day of Pentecost uh, and they were baptised and, and joined, you know, part of, became part of the church, etc. there. They continued steadfastly learning of the Lord Jesus, whom they come to know and trust as Saviour, uh, in respect that they were of what they of what they hardly had had uh, and genuinely come to believe. Now, the day of Pentecost was what? The day of Pentecost was the day that the Holy Spirit of God was given by the Father, in the sense that we see there in Acts chapter two. It's interesting to note what are we to do? Ephesians four, verse three. We are to endeavour, we are to, to earnestly try to keep the unity of the what? The Spirit. The Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God. So here in Acts chapter 2 verse uh, 42, we see that the, these new believers, their hearts have been spoken to by the Holy Spirit of God when the Word of God has been preached. They believed. Thousands saved in one day. That's the work of the Holy Spirit, not of men. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. They're learning more about the Lord. They're soaking it in like a sponge. So then verse uh, 44 and 45, we see there that they understood what they had gained through the gospel of the grace of God and what they had was to be used as the Lord saw fit for the furtherance of God's eternal purpose. They were quite generous with that. Verse, because, why? Because the Holy Spirit of God is speaking to their hearts. Verse 46, we see them continuing daily with one accord. Now they didn't just continue in one accord, but it says they continued daily with one accord. In other words, indicating that they endeavoured or earnestly pursued unity in the Spirit. Now, in Ephesians 4 verse 3, where it says about doing it in the bond of peace, and peace there means being, peace there being the uniting principle, the cement that unites, a bond. And so we, we see by, by comparing Acts chapter 2 with Ephesians 4 and verse 3, that we see the importance of the Holy Spirit of God's work in keeping unity in the body. We're seeing the Holy Spirit work through the fruit of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Uh, Acts chapter 2 verses 40, 42 to 47, you can see the, these joyful people that knew the love of God and that they were at peace. And you can see the result, look at verse 47. It says, praising God, Acts 2 47, sorry, Praising God and having favour with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. And so uh, we're seeing there the result. We're seeing exactly what we've been looking at this morning in Ephesians. By the unity in the spirit, the early church there in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2. 
we're able to be used by God for his eternal purpose. Acts 2.47, it says, and having favour with all the people. You know, in those early days, not even the Pharisees and the Sadducees dared raise their head at that, at that particular time about it. It says they had favour with all the people. And it says, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Now, hmm, let me think. That reminds us of what we were looking at before, what, doesn't it? Ephesians 1 verse 10, that the Lord gathering all these people to him according to his eternal purpose. It, that, that was, that's the whole purpose of it. And so unity in the early church there in Jerusalem produced exactly what God wanted it to produce. It took unity. It took them being of one mind or one accord, as, it's, as, as it says there, same thing. And so uh, the Lord added daily, such as should be saved. So it's a perfect example. You know, at one point there, uh, over in uh, Acts chapter 4, there was about 5,000 men saved. Uh, when uh, Peter and John healed the lame man. That's the work of the Holy Spirit of God. That's, you can add on to that, women and children. Thousands in one day. So we're seeing that what God has put down in Ephesians chapter 4 <coughs> in respect of being in unity, in the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace is really part and parcel of what God expects from us. It doesn't just come naturally. As, it, Paul, as Paul wrote there, endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit. Earnestly trying to, 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 to work towards it. To keep, keep it always in mind. What does that take? It takes a surrender of self. It really does. It's easy for us to look at somebody else and go, oh, look at that person over there. Look at my brother in Christ or my sister in Christ over there. Oh, no, 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 we can't do that. We've got to surrender self. Now, a second point, getting hold, and now we've got a hold of that, that we, we really need to endeavour to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Our second point is this. We are to grasp that there is one true cause, and it takes that unity to pursue it. Uh, think about it, Acts chapter 11. Let's go to Acts chapter 11. In your Bibles, Acts 11. Now this is uh, post the persecution. Post the persecution. Paul has, uh, sorry, Saul has become Paul. Saul, we know, was on the road to Damascus to, to gather more of the disciples of Christ to persecute them, to take them off to jail, etc. Uh, the Lord appears to him, he gets saved. Saul becomes Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles. But uh, here in the, in the changeover period between the Saul and Paul, we see in Acts chapter 11 some of the results of, of Paul's persecution, you know, the, the persecution that Paul led. And uh, we see unified believers that fled from the persecution still starting churches. Uh, it was not every man for himself. If you look there in, uh, in Acts chapter 11, I go down to uh, verse, number, verse number 20, and some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. Uh, and the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. A great number. Now, these were people, understand, these were people that had fled the persecution. They didn't go, I'll see you later, mate, I'm, I'm going to take care of my own. I'm going to, I'm going to look after my own skin. Uh, all the best, but see you later. No, they didn't do that. They were still unified. These are, these are people that had experienced the working of the Holy Spirit of God that were unified. They had the unity of the Spirit there in Jerusalem uh, from, the, from, the, from the time that, you know, when, when Christ came and, uh, sorry, when the Holy Spirit came and revival broke out there and, and God did a great work and they were, they were unified. And they saw how God used that unity. They also saw how, like for example, in Acts 4, where the high priest and, and the Pharisees, etc., uh, where, they, where they gathered Peter and John and, and hauled them before him, uh, before them, to, to tell them to stop doing what they were doing. But, they, but even then, 
uh, because of, the, of what God had done through these two men, they couldn't do anything to them. But they saw the persecution starting to arise. But did it stop them? No, they were still unified. When the persecution broke out, we can see the result there. Some of them went as far as Antioch and still being faithful to God despite their physical circumstances, uh, they were still unified in Christ. They still shared the gospel. Now the church that started there in Antioch uh, was perhaps the most important church for we, for we Gentiles in the New Testament. Uh, why? Because that was the local church that Paul was commissioned by uh, to go to the work that God had called him for. It's funny, isn't it? You know how God works things. Here's Paul, he's, he's persecuting the believers and they're, they're scattering from him. And God used what Paul had done when he was unsaved to set up the church that would then send him out to the Gentiles, his mission. That's the hand of God. But nonetheless, we, 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 uh, we see that that was the church that Paul was sent to. Now sent from, I should say. So people we look at that example there and we see born again believers that got a hold of the fact that we are one in Christ. We are one in, in God but that we need to be unified in the spirit as we walk and we talk in, you know, on this earth, as we live our lives for the Lord here on this earth. We need to be one. There needs to be unity through the Holy Spirit of God. And our third point this morning is, is this. We need to be of one mind in unity through the Spirit. The previous point, the point number two was there is, we need to grasp that there is one true cause. The third point is we need to be of one mind in unity through the Spirit. So go back to Ephesians chapter 3, 4 verse 3. Same verse, endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. The reality is, if each God-ordained local church that the Lord has started, if we are of one mind through the Spirit, then we will be one mind for the cause of Christ. Now in Acts chapter 2 verse 46, it says that they, went, that they were in one accord as they went to the temple. Mm -hmm. The early church, they went to the temple daily. They went daily from, from house to house breaking bread. It says that they are one accord. Now where it says one accord, that means harmony of minds. Harmony of minds. And we see that in all that they did. Like I said, every day they went to the temple. So there's your spiritual aspect of your life. Every day they went from house to house breaking bread. There's the physical. It was not about what's in this for me. It wasn't about, oh, that's not fair to me. It was about being unified in Christ. You know, uh, when you get a hold of the promises of God, for example, but my God shall supply all your need through his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Uh, when you think about Hebrews, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. You think about promises like those, and you, you apply that to the early church there in Acts chapter 2 and onwards, you can see that they lived those promises. In this day and age that we live in, we tend to think, oh, yeah, I want to serve you, God, but how's that going to affect me? We're letting self get in the way of us being of one mind. We need to realise that God is, if you have a look there in, in verse number 6, Ephesians 4 verse 6, what does it say? One God and Father of all, who is above all. He's above all. And through all, and in you all. How, how this, this thing here, this flesh, hinders us. How this thing up here hinders us. 
in, in, in what Paul has been inspired to write here in Ephesians by the Lord. Whether we like it or not, at often times in our lives, it's us first and God second. It is. People, uh, what we see here, Acts chapter 11, we looked at, it was God first. Yeah, they had to flee for their safety, but that didn't stop them from being unified and, and sharing others about God's eternal purpose for, for everyone's life. Didn't stop them. They're still working together. They started the church together and uh, by, the, by the working of God and God used it, like I said, that was to send the church for Paul, Antioch. Paul, the man that God used to write basically half of the New Testament. Because they put God first and that came through being, uh, through having un unity in the spirit, in the bond of peace. So people, uh, final note, it says keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. It shows that real unity only comes through the Holy Spirit of God's working in our lives. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God and you are not your own? Do you let the Holy Spirit of God work in your heart? Do you let the Holy Spirit of God speak to you about His eternal purpose and how vital it is for us to let Him work in our lives to, that we might have the bond of peace that brings unity of the Spirit in our church? And if, and if God ever led any of us to, to, another, to another place to live and we join another church, then would we be in the bond of peace there and, and have the unity of the Spirit? So let me just close with this, repeating that verse. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, that is Paul, beseech you, I beg you, that you walk worthy of of the vocation wherewith, and let me emphasize this, ye are called. You are called to that. You might say, oh, it's for the person next to me. No, 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 it's for you. If you're born again, it's for you. God has given us every single born again believer that command. That you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Let's pray. And Father, I, I Lord, thank you for your great love for us. Thank you, Lord, for the liberty to be able to stand here today and Lord, just to open your word and to delve into its riches and, and, I, and I hope and pray Lord that the Holy Spirit of God has used and can use what you've given to speak to all of our hearts Lord including my own <clears throat> Lord may we may we learn sincerely the lessons that we've seen here in your word may the Holy Spirit of God speak to our hearts that yes, it is possible, very much possible for all of us to be in one accord, one mind, to be in unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Lord, that you could use us more mightily for your eternal purpose how you yearn for 
those that are those that, that are out there that don't know you as their Lord and Saviour, how you yearn for them to, to come to accept you as their Lord and Saviour. And Lord, I think of Luke 15, where it says that there is one, that there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repented. Lord, every time one person, one sinner, sees their sinfulness and their guilt before you, the holy, sinless God of heaven and earth, and they trust you as their Lord and Saviour, every time they do that and they trust you as their Saviour, you rejoice. It's not talking about the angels, it's talking about your angels that are in your presence. There's joy in the presence of the angels of God. Well, how you rejoice in that. How you yearn for that to be all the time. Help us, I pray, Lord, to be part of your eternal purpose by seeking unity in the spirit, in the bond of peace. And Father, I thank you for that. Lord, I commit these things to you. I do ask and pray them in Jesus' name. Amen. As the music plays here this morning, just have all heads bowed and all eyes closed. All heads bowed, all eyes closed, and uh, just at this time, just let me ask you is it something you've ever thought about to actually actively pursue? Unity in the spirit, in the bond of peace. Is that something that you actively pursue? It's something the Lord wants us to. Well, it's bad, always closed. And so just spend some time with the Lord and consider that this morning. standing and seeing 127 again and uh, if you're still praying please continue to do so number 127 if you're finished praying you'll be upstanding
your great love for us. Uh, Lord, uh, thank you for your desire for us to be in unity, for your honour and for your glory. And Father, I just do pray as we go from here this morning that you would lead and guide through the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, Lord, bless us as we go and our Father ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord bless you in the morning. Amen. Uh -huh.